Okay. So, um, first, um, we're going to talk about strategy. Actually, I'm going to step back and you say, uh, uh, let's see, yeah. We're going to strategy. We're going to talk about products. Uh, we're going to talk about income and pricing. We're going to talk about partners and projects, hubs, growth, uh, particularly with regards to the teams, and then comms and marketing. Uh, and, uh, and Peter and I'll do this whole thing, including the bits that involve other you know, people's departments, the areas of responsibility, whatever. And then we can talk about, we can chip in with specific clarifications, whatever, but we're just going to more or less go through it. Right? Uh, strategy. Um, one of the things that I like to uh, express is that we're, you know, we, we're, we're changing something that people do. Uh, and in this space, um, uh, I, I call it, you know, we compete unfairly. Uh, in a, in a, another way of putting it is, you know, looking at our competitive advantages. Uh, but what I mean by competing unfairly, I'll get to that. So the old is in this space where we're working is control, closed, paper-based, you know, individual systems integration, people do things in batch, top-down, you know, data to check whether things are being done properly, right? And the kind of things that we do, and we're not alone in doing that, but we do it in a particular configuration. And instead of control, we work with more with trust. Instead of closed, we work more with open, etc. Web, mobile instead of paper, Collaborative more than individual, you know, open standards, real time instead of batch. You know, top down we work a lot with bottom up. We see that a lot in the way people try to do reporting or try to gather data. A lot of top down approaches, whereas something like Flow, Flow and, and RSR is much more bottom up than it is top down. Uh, and data to steer and improve rather than data to check that something has been done. And, and we use some of these things in ways that others have a hard time to compete with. Uh, uh, and I particularly think about com commercial organizations uh, that compete with what we do. They build things that compete with flow or whatever. But there are also organizations like uh, the World Bank, which go about things in weird ways, in my view. Uh, not everywhere and all the time, but some of that. Um, and, and we then do it more open and collaborative open standards than, than they are able to do because of the way they're structured. And, uh, and we think it's good that we can do that because we think our solutions are better. So, products. We got a bunch of products. Actually, the, the, there's a product that is mostly missing on our slides. And we can talk a little bit about that. And that's actually consortium sites that is going to have to get a new name because that doesn't kind of work. But it's Think of that as being part of one of these blobs here. But we have a bunch of products. Um, there are now, uh, you know, several of them are maturing. We're getting to a point where people really take these seriously. But they're loosely interconnected. It's like a, it's like a tube line, tube system, which has like one interchange and the other ones are independent lines. And we need to fix that. We need to make them better interconnected. That's a really important part of what we do. So I'm, not, I'm just going to skip over these because you know what these tools are, right? I don't have to explain to you. Woo, right? <laughs> um, and, and, uh, but think of uh, uh, consortium sites as one of part of these, right? The, this is really important um, because uh, a lot of the things that we talk about, we understand that these can be done. Uh, but a lot of the organizations that we talk about say that it's impossible, it's too complicated, that's not how government works, that's not how the sector works, all of these things, right? Um, and, and they said that since we started. Not everybody, but enough of people that if you just listen to them and say, they must be right, then you kind of, it's not going to work, right? It's, the mountain is too big or, or whatever, we're never going to climb it. But it, it's, it's actually, you know, we've had the vision, we've had it for quite a number of years. Uh, a lot of this vision, uh, you know, stems from, from stuff way before I started getting involved with, with any of this stuff. Like uh, Jeroen, you know, he was dreaming of the, the, the world hydrological memory, 
you know, long about long before we started doing aqua, right? And in the end, that's the kind of things we're building now, right? So the future is what we make it. That we can make the future, and we have to decide what is the future that we want, and then we'll go and make it. Uh, because we can predict the future. Uh, we predicted that things like RSR was going to work. We predicted that we we're going to have you know, hundreds of partners working with us. We predicted all these things, and then we made out, went out and made them happen, and we were surprised that it worked. <laughs> right? But this is important. Don't forget that. Right? Uh, and we have to make responsible decisions so that we end up in the right place. So, um, you know what our products look like right now. You know how people use our tools, or sometimes not use our tools when they should use our tools. But the future looks different, right? So here are a couple of things that used to put us in the, the, in the right mood for what the future is actually like. The future is, you know, the, yeah, you've heard Mark uh, Charmer talk about giant iPads on the walls where you can walk up to them and kind of like, oh, here's the Mekong River, and you can kind of do this to sweep along the river and see who's working on what, where are the pollution points, what's going on. You know, that's the kind of user interface you should imagine yourself. That's where we're going to end up eventually. Uh, and, and it's not like a, it's not a, a, you know, a weird thing or, you know, how many have seen Minority Report? Yeah. Right? A few of you have seen the film, right? And, and actually the things that they do, except for the prediction based on psychics, but everything else, technology-wise, is happening. It's probably full of Nokia-sponsored products as well, and that doesn't happen either. Chris, really. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, this stuff is actually, user interface-wise, is happening. So, so, you know, the Mekong River on the wall where people walk up and look and interact with it to understand what's happening with it, or, or you know, the Dutch deltas, or whatever it is, um, that's how it's going to be. It, it's going to be... You know, we're going to present these things in different ways um, that are different than what they're presented today. And that's the, the stuff that most people will see and understand and, and, and be grabbed by. But, you know, when you're actually working in this space, it's a little bit more like, you know, information management. And then it ends up more like this from a practical point of view, right? And this is actually a, a fire brigade map on how uh, things work and for the fire brigade. But, but nevertheless, these are the kind of things that people actually are looking for, right? You know, they, they want something that says, where are all our water points? Uh, what's the coverage re in relation to the population? Which areas have got less and more? You know, well, you know, are, are we doing well trend-wise? You know, blah, blah, blah. Th those types of things are the things that our products um, collect data for, and eventually we're going to need to present them like that. So, so, you know, we talk about new products, Aqua Dash, uh, be, as being these kind of tools where you mash up data in different ways and then you present it, right? And we, don't, we do some limited things of this as part of our products already. Uh, but what people are really looking for, they don't want RSR data, they don't want flow data. They want RSR flow and hydrological and population data all kind of mixed up in different ways so they can work with. And that's the kind of future that we're working towards. So, so uh, I'm um, investigating at the moment using the Liberia data that we have because it's public data that's available. You can download it and use it. It's actually is linked on to the uh, consortium site called uh, uh, Liberia Wash or Wash Liberia dot org. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to use that data. It, the data was used to produce something called the Liberia Water Point Atlas. The core data that came from it was flow data, ten thousand water points. You know, all these blue little dots were were surveys in um, uh, flow done with flow uh, uh, in Liberia. They sent you know thirty people out, motorcycles and cars for three months, and came back with all this data. And then they made this atlas, which has lots of different um, visualizations uh, of how this reflects on in relation to the or you know the country, the poverty levels what type of pumps, you know, what works, what doesn't, you know, that kind of thing. And then they made policies 
they were actually very practical out of that data. They decided to standardize on certain types of technology. They decided to standardize on working in certain regions or whatever it was. Uh, good work. But it took them like eight months after they got the data in to actually assemble all this information. And we think that most of these are you know, things we could just can. We could have standard reports that if you ask these questions, you can have these kind of analysis pop out the other end. Right? Uh, and people want these kind of standard things as part of their dashboards, but it also needs to be presented to the public in a way that is much more walk up to that big wall and understand how the situation works. You know, here's another visual of a particular part of uh, Liberia. It's up here somewhere. Oops. Uh, as you can see here, right? it's a county, some stats and some things. These are the kind of things that we need to pull out of our systems to present to people because that's what they're looking for. Uh, and we, we're going to do that uh, using these types of tools as a, as a basis for what we're doing. Right? And, and, uh, but to talk about that from a technical product point of view, <laughs> Mark, you're drunk. <laughs> well, no, no, it's the camera. It would have been a nice to have a bit more notice on videoing you doing the talk. That yeah. <laughs> That's good. So we, I should have when you that. talk technology and, and things, you have to talk in boxes. You can't do it with a nice logo, so we're going to rearrange this a little bit. So, so one of the things that we noticed then in, in, around all this stuff is that, of course, you, we have Wiki, Aquapedia, we have RSR data, Flow data, ERT data, but we also want external data. So there might be curated data, stuff that Yassim was talking about earlier, you know, pulling things in from the World Bank, you know, places where there is known data from certain areas that needs to be compared to all this other stuff. But there might also be, the user might have data that they want to use. So that they might have a set of data, some of their priorities data, or other things uh, that, that, uh, uh, that they want to use to match up to this. And um, to do that, you know, we're going to need essentially partner-facing services. We got some of this already. You know, these tools, the green boxes means there's stuff that's there doing something uh, fairly useful already. Uh, the white stuff is stuff that we don't do in the way I envisage that we will do them in the future. So partner-facing services will have some dashboards and visualizations, just like the, one, the ones I showed earlier, right? Uh, and part of this is a whole bunch of suites that, that, of tools that our partners use. There will be websites, think consortium sites, think partner sites, think other things, right? Notification services, You've, you want to subscribe to updates or you want to subscribe to something else. Uh, you know, mobile apps, you know, Flow does some of this, RSR is going to do some of this, etc. There, there are pieces of this, but there might be, you might want to have dashboards on your tablet. You know. To, you can quickly see what's going on. Uh, widgets, you know, you know, crank out reports out of these systems. Uh, APIs that you use in different ways. Um, data export systems. And, and this is not a comprehensive list. This is just an example of the kind of things that all of our tools should be able to push out towards the audience, the people that use these tools, right? Uh, so, so you know, Aquapedia should have notifications, mobile apps, data export as well, just uh, widgets, just like Flow and RSR and, and open should have, right? But to make this happen at this level, we need infrastructure. Um, and there needs to be a bunch of support services to make that happen. And the support services are things like monitoring our infrastructure. Does it work? Is it up and running? Or, or you know, does it, is it under a denial of service attack like Aquapedia was this weekend and it brought it down due to a bug in a cache system or something like that, which actually happened. So we need to know that our servers are up and running. Uh, we need to store data. At the moment we store data in, in a few different places. Uh, we have to good, have good deployment and testing systems. We have to have you know, a login service. It, I fundamentally believe it's wrong that you know, a government official to view his data and his particular presentation of his data should log into Facebook to be able to see it. Right? I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't work. There's no long-term viability in that. Uh, you know, and, and Google's login services is essentially that these days. 
you know, they're pushing everyone towards Google+, Plus, which is a competitor to Facebook. And, it, you know, it, that's not viable. So we're going to, I believe, uh, very importantly, need to run, uh, you know, identification and login services, um, uh, authentication. Uh, mapping services, we use things like Google Maps at the moment. Uh, we're probably going to be using other things in the long run. And the scale of what we do means that we can't just be a free, ro free rider on top of things like OpenStreetMap. We're actually going to have to pay for this stuff. Uh, analytics, understanding the use of this data in different ways of form. They're both web analytics to understand how this data is being used, but they're also the analytics services that pushes out, you know, content to reports and things like that. So, so um, you know, flow in itself needs analytical service. It has some basic analytic service, but it, we need more comprehensive tools. And we shouldn't build them just for flow. We should build them for all our tools so that we can have a toolkit to use. Um, visualizations, transforms, you know, language. There are all sorts of stuff in here. And, and this, is not, this is not the, you know, the complete thing. Somebody always points out something I missed when I did that. And, you know, I know it's not the full thing, but it used an idea. And the yellow things are things that are partially in place at the moment. And, and the, the white boxes are things that we actually need to work on um, as our own. And on top of that, you know, we need a good user administration interface for these things. Uh, when you actually look at, for example, nearly all of this, there are all these components are available as the open source components that we can integrate. Um, but the actual user integration, the, the user interface integration and making it easy to use them together, that's our work. Because nobody's done it in the way that's needed to help this sector. And it turns out, as we know, with all of our work, it's quite a lot of work sometimes to get it so that it's actually useful in the context that we're in. So, um, that is going to become the, you know, the new act for platform. It's sort of this stuff at the moment, uh, with bits and pieces that are doing a really good job already, but we're going to make it much more big and comprehensive in this, uh, and it's going to become the act for platform. And, and, and for anyone who's sort of thinking about this a little bit, you realize that a lot of this stuff is actually, it's like, oh, wait a minute, that sounds like stuff Google does. Right? And the more you look at it this way, we're a, a niche competitor to organizations like Google. Right? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, and why that is the case. But the general idea is um, that we're building tools on, uh, to, to fix poverty, which is not something like Google's focus. But you could use their tools for that. But the, gradually, these moves from the stuff we're doing, moving from being development, international development corporation slash development aid support, to becoming governance tools, tools to run, monitor, understand infrastructure of countries. And I fundamentally believe that that's not a good place to lock them into Oracle, Google, you know, SAP, IBM. Uh, in the long run, you want to own your own infrastructure as a, as in, on a regional level. You don't when you don't when you step out the door to step on your bike to bike somewhere. You don't want it to be a toll road everywhere, right? So, so good, successful countries own their own local infrastructure. They own their power lines. They own their roads. They own their sewage pipelines. They own all of this stuff locally, and then sometimes people or companies help them run it in different ways. And I think the IT infrastructure for countries is going to be just as important as their electricity infrastructure in the long run. Um, and the only way they're not going to end up having a toll road for every action that you know, a government official does or a you know, citizen does is going to actually be working on open source software. So that at some point they can take the ownership of this if they need to. Uh, and, and that's where we come in. We help them build some of that uh, to put that in place. Um, so this stuff is going to be thought of more like this by the end user. But this is what it takes to make that work. 
in the long run. And it's not something you do, you know, in a three months, you know, let's throw it together and get all these pieces together. It takes time, right, as we know. It takes quite a long time to get some of the pieces, but we have to have a vision, we have to have somewhere where we're going. So, Peter, you want to take that part? Yeah. Unlike Thomas, I also don't know which are the next slides that uh, you're going to see, so I have to improvise a bit. Um, no, I think one of the, the core things in the way uh, we started to look at ACFO in six years ago or so, seven, is that it's actually uh, quite important to both have the software products and services in-house and obviously the partner support. I think that's quite critical in, in, uh, in being successful and I think it's a balance that we really need to uh, look after because I think that's what makes us unique, sort of being in the, in the middle of, of software and also uh, creating trust to the partners that we work with that we can help them out. And helping them out, in, in my view, uh, means solving their problem. And solving their problem is having the tools or the products to do that, but also giving them the trust and helping to them to really uh, absorb it. Obviously, uh, that comes with uh, different demands, and one of it is, is account management. We, we call that more the type of work we do here, talking with partners, building the partnerships, having meetings. It's, uh, you know, really thinking through how they can strategically use this in programs or anything. It comes with much more uh, hands-on training. Uh, I wanted to show a video that I made from uh, Mark uh, in Indonesia, which is a one-minute video clip, and I think the software developers should look at it because it's quite interesting. It's Mark explaining them how they can use Flow, and then you see people around the table, and half of them speak sort of Indonesian type English and other ways and they're pointing at stuff and where did the date go and if you look at that video I think it's quite crucial that because those are the people that are going to run into the fields and map you know 300,000 water points and if you look at that video and I would ask you do we all feel comfortable that they would go into the field and to use these type of tools and will they do well you know we have to because if they don't do it, we cannot do it. So the answer should be yes, but at the same time, you sort of sense the, the, yeah, the difficulties in it. And I think that's really core. Um, technical account management, I think uh, once we scale, it's going to become bigger. You can sense it that the type of projects we did with Cordate, with Cartno and others, these are sort of the, the technical type um, uh, partner support that we don't really have in place. I mean, Adrian is doing a bit of that, but that's... Uh, an area where we obviously feel some pressure. I mean, Mark is doing it, but really I think we need technical account management. People that uh, are a technical team, but very focused on individual scaled uh, technical demands that can buffer. So I think that that will grow over the next uh, periods. Um, what I wanted to do is not to, to look uh, too far uh, beyond, but focusing a bit on uh, uh, some of the elements of our work that are quite important as well. Um, it was quite a technical drawing that was made for the advisory board, but uh, uh, just to give you a sense, I thought it was interesting to look at uh, our income. So income is just uh, funds that uh, came to ACFO, and what we did is, uh, uh, Stefan actually helped to do this. Uh, you see two things here, you see obviously the income over time, and uh, 2013 is our forecast still. And the blue one is operational income, so that's income from services we provide, and the orangey bits are income from uh, grants. Uh, when we started, um, we wanted to have a good business model in uh, ACFO, even though we're not profit, so we can break even in time. I think that's crucial, uh, because it's the only way in which you can uh, support growth. Uh, some interesting things are happening, uh, that the government grants that we got are actually becoming uh, smaller. And that's mainly the Dutch government, um, yeah. if you look at it. So quite a lot comes from operational income. And you also see that other grants have been picking up quite quickly. And these are mainly US private foundations. If you actually look now at Gates, uh, Hilton, Cisco, these type of funders, they're actually quite uh, big. And there's quite a lot of opportunity because they really sometimes understand the software side of what we do a bit better. So to get some strategic grants in the development. Um, you also see that the, the income from uh, operational services is growing quite a lot this year compared to last year. And that comes with different demands, and I think we're all feeling that pressure a bit. 
sometimes, and that uh, that comes because uh, there's more work that comes with the income. So that also means we're less flexible. So we're not paid to uh, cover our own work, but we're paid to do stuff for partners. And that's a, that's a healthy thing that we're seeing. One of the other ones uh, that uh, I was sort of uh, intrigued about when I looked at this is that you see that quite a lot of income from, comes from services we provide to consortia. So not to an individual NGO or a company, but really to consortia. And I think consortia are strategically very important for us. You see it in the Wash Alliance, in Connect for Change, Football for Wash, Millennium Water Alliance in the US, because you get introduced to a group of partners quite quickly, and if they're interested, quite a lot of them might pick it up uh, in their own organization, but it's a good stepping stone because you have quite a lot of scale, right? You work with quite some partners quite uh, quickly, uh, and that's a good uh, model, I think, to uh, continue. Second thing that's interesting is that uh, to use the type of tools that we have, I think it makes working in consortia, which is becoming the norm in the sector, much easier. I mean, using a tool for your own individual organization's use, that's one. But if you work in a consortia, how do you know what the other five partners are doing or your hundred local partners? So I think in that sort of uh, interaction with multiple partners, our tools are quite um, powerful. So I think the consortia focus, also in the new areas that we're working, US, Asia, Africa, is really important uh, because uh, I think that's really where uh, the benefits come and it also drives quite a lot of our um, income. So this uh, sort of gives you a bit of an overview. Um, the partners that we're working with, uh, or that are using our tools, I should say, we're mainly working with the support partners, as you know, but the local partners are now spread uh, across the globe. So it's a large, uh, large overview. And obviously, um, particularly when you look at training or really the, the local support, we need to support that regionally. So we're obviously looking at uh, this map and how best uh, to support it. Um, yeah, what I did here um, is more strategy. Um, if you look at the contracts that we signed, um, so the programs, the partners, the main partners that we work for, it's actually not that many. It's like 25 or 30 or so. And they usually have quite a lot of local partners. But if you look at the contracts that we signed, that are the, the colored, the, how do you say it? Deeply colored blocks. So you see that quite a lot of the contracts are with are signed in Europe and uh, in the US because we actively started a US strategy. As you know, uh, I've been traveling a lot, Thomas, and many others of us, and we have people there. Uh, so these are really the partners that we're uh, signing contacts with, and these light colored uh, blue and browns is where we have to support <coughs> their local partners or their work. So to give you an idea, this is where the contracts are signed and the program, the responsibilities. But to do that, we need to provide sometimes support or training <coughs> in these regions. So uh, if people ask why do we need the hubs, it's also to uh, focus on the commitments we have in place in these regions. Now, the only exceptions are uh, projects like UN Habitat, which is still signed here, but it's actually local. Cardinal, and that's one of the reasons why it's also important for us to travel there, because that, that's really a, uh, an Australian based partner, an Australian contract, and that's a new thing. And we have some smaller projects uh, in Asia. Um, but I think this is an important one because overall in our strategy, uh, you can see that by focusing on Europe and the US, uh, it drives a lot of work, also in these regions where we can execute some work and then sort of organically grow by picking some extra partners uh, in the region. I might uh, spit this, but what we're obviously doing as well is to look and plot the amount of work, uh, budget-wise, in the different regions. Don't want to go too much into detail, but uh, if you look at the uh, size, the value, the value of work we have to do, uh, this is sort of plotted per region, and you see that if you look at all the trainings, etc., in the different regions, it's already quite a lot, and that means that it's uh, becoming uh, a base to do our work uh, from. This is where I think, uh, so just to give you a sense where we think uh, it will grow. Obviously in the regions it will grow quite quickly uh, and we expect quite a lot of a big move in West Africa uh, because there's a lot of work for UNICEF and others that will pick up quickly. Uh, Southeast Asia, Asia, almost all the regions are, are picking up um, and this will only continue obviously. So. Uh, 
something most people might not be that aware of, but we price our the services we provide, and we do that based on uh, on a model. It's a pricing sheet. I don't know if you, many of you have seen it. But we're pricing the, the products, the software products, or the service we provide. I will I can send this in detail. And the partner support and the training, etc. So, so we do that uh, with the idea, obviously, to break even. And the model that we use in that is that we split the time. So we look at which type of partners are we working for. We either have uh, corporates or NGOs. And there are different uh, prices attached to it. So if you're a company like Mars, you pay more for a day than... Uh, a local NGO or an NGO partner and uh, so we work with tariffs so the products have a fixed price so flow or RSR is a fixed price um, we're thinking of splitting it actually also that corporates pay more for a flow instance than um, NGOs do don't do that now but that's what we want to do and then we have the partner support um, we do based on tariffs so that can be local tariffs right if you have a local somebody working in East Africa, a day tariff is lower than somebody working in Europe, for example. Few partners in RSR, as you know, can use the tools for free still. So if you're an NGO like Cordate, you might have uh, support for RSR, and the local partners are then free to use it. And I think that's a very important model because it allows local partners to use the tools. We're thinking in the same direction for things like Flow. I mean, if, if a large partner has an instance and they have local partners that they want, that they agree with, can use their instance, we think that's fine, that so we don't have to charge uh, the local partners because it, it creates a, sort of an openness on local level. Um, yeah, something that's uh, more to give you an insight in what we're doing. Um, we've plotted the large uh, partners that we're working with. I think many of you have heard them sometimes. And we're looking now at the, the sizes of the portfolio. So if you look at the water portfolio of Degas as an example, that's approximately 300 million. Um, and what we've done here is we looked at which products are they currently using. So RSR, Flow, Open Data, and the Dutch uh, water portfolio. In which region is it? Uh, uh, does it have strategical impact or potential? So we look at uh, US, Europe, South America should be a mark as well, but less. East Africa, West Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia. Now, if you look at this, uh, what I'm trying to, to show here is A, obviously there's a few partners that have really large development portfolios and that are quite uh, important for us to really scale our work with. So if you look here, UNICEF is huge, right? So the strategic partnership with UNICEF at scale would mean that we have a lot of work to do and it could be a very good basis to, uh, to uh, support our growth. Others. Dutch ministry, obviously, but also if you look at NGOs like Corde, these are huge, 100 million euro portfolios. Um, so this is a way of sort of looking at how can we also focus a bit on what, where are the big uh, movers and uh, do that. Also, if you look at most of our partners are not using most of our products. So this is an important one. If you look at this, you can see there's a lot of opportunity to, to say, hey, with waste is already using RSR, but they haven't used Flow, they haven't used OpenA. While they might be interested, right? To start to look at it like this. Other ways of, uh, that we use this for is, for example, to say, hey, Cordit is a strong partner of ACFO already, but they actually also work in Asia. So as I meet that is in Asia, actually talk to the local office of Cordate to say, hey, we're already doing projects for you in East Africa, would you be interested in doing it in this region as well? You know, all these type of things haven't really uh, been done yet. So there's a lot of potential within our existing uh, network. Um, and that brings me to, to this. Um, it's a partnership uh, map, Linda made. So it's, if you want to get partners, you need to acquire them, you need to activate them. It takes a lot of time, right? It's the type of work we do. Once you have them, it's important to keep them. We do that with uh, quite a lot of personal meetings, but obviously product updates. If a product gets improved, the partners can use it. We have newsletters, workshops, we have track days. You know, this is, this is account management. Uh, but there's also opportunities to, to uh, what I would say, is upsell, cross-sell. So if a partner is using one product, can, would they be interested in using a second that we offer? Uh, regional cell, if we've been working with a partner in East Africa but they also have activities in a different region, would they be interested? Because you already have a case, right? It's a lot easier to not have to go through this whole process but just focus on people 
uh, ingredients and referrals, when things go well, there's sort of a natural tendency that these type of partners will attract others, right? These type of cases, so I think it, that's quite important. Overall, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for us to look at the current partnership and start pulling them through this, uh, this loop. So I think uh, there's a risk uh, also that we focus too much here. You need to focus here as well, so it's not that black and white, but we really need to strategically think also of how do we pull a few of these big movers through this. Uh, so the strategy, in short, um, pull through strategy. So really looking at the, the strong, larger partners that we have and how can we really moving from them using us a bit or having done a pilot project to using us a, as an organizational-wide uh, strategy in the regions for different products. And, and some partners might only deliberately choose to use one product, it's fine, but at least we need to have these type of conversations. So that's also what we're doing now, you know, looking at strategic partnerships with Cordate, with ICO, with the Dutch Ministry, you and Habitat, you've heard that this morning, it's really about getting clarity on what do they want to do with us over the next two, three years. Focus, water and sanitation, obviously, it's where we started, where we're strong, where we can show quite a lot of uh, impact. But it's also a risk that people still perceive us as, oh, it's the water and sanitation tools type guys. And I think that's really what we need to break. So we need to have some good examples in different uh, sectors. We have that, but we need to communicate it, and we really need to move away a bit from the, uh, it's water related. I still get quite a lot of questions, from two, even from the Dutch ministry. Oh yeah, it's great, Agfa, I would love to scale it up, but uh, yeah, we also have health and you can it. Yeah, the tools are generic and it, it looks, for us, it's very logical, but it's not always perceived like it. Food security is a very interesting one. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. We think that's a big new sector that uh, there's a lot uh, to do. And follow our partners. Um, it's interesting, Von Koeman said, our board, advisory board, following partners is not a strategy because it has no end. Um, <laughs> it has ambition, but uh, uh, it is an important one because it's uh, obviously a natural, uh, natural way of doing it. So that brings us to these hubs. Um, where are we at the moment? Um, um, the established ones, so we have uh, the, obviously here in Amsterdam we're registered. And uh, in Kenya, we're actually registered as well. Uh, Luke has a limited because else he had to leave the country. In process, I mean, we're actually registered in uh, in the U.S. as a foundation. We obviously have uh, Henry and Katie there, uh, but we're activating it. It's sort of an empty shell. Uh, in India, Amit, we're looking at uh, a place. They now have three people uh, in the eco office. Uh, needed West Africa. It's going to be needed fast. Uh, if you know, looked at the other picture I showed, there's quite a lot of work in the region and we're still sort of uh, flying in and starting what we need to have a local uh, presence. Uh, considering uh, Southeast Asia and uh, South America. So this is sort of what we're looking at and if, uh, what we're trying to do here is sort of to plot uh, where we see the type of function. So, so from an office like this, what are the functions we're providing? And then you see that we, we have communication here, right, in, uh, uh, in Europe. We have account management, call it partner, key partner accounts, meetings, all those type of stuff. We have operations. We're actually still doing quite a lot of operational support to the regions uh, from this office. Uh, sales, call it, yeah, the, the sale, the fundraising. Uh, development, obviously we have a lot of uh, software development here. And in the different regions, this is just a bit of a you know, got feeling way of presenting it, but in the US we have some account management, operations, we start to do a little bit of sales, we have some development capacity there, so it's just a way of plotting uh, opportunities. You see that we're starting a little bit of sales in these regions, but it's mainly operational work. So, this is the, the functions today, and this is what, uh, so from here to here, is what we uh, expect over the next years. And I think uh, to look uh, some of the changes, some of the operational work we're doing in, uh, uh, from this office has sort of organically grown. Think of things like uh, into helping partners to enter projects, right? People are still doing that quite a lot here in the office, uh, but the projects actually are in the region. So if you would have started that from scratch, it's a, it's a function that you might want to uh, 
uh, do a lot more uh, in the regions, right? It's A, it's cheaper to, to have people locally there, they're closer to the project. So there's, it's just an example, but you can imagine there's some of the things that have grown organically that are now being done here that might be considered to be done a bit more in the regions. And other things like the partnership type uh, support, you know, as you know, we don't really have the capacity probably in these regions to go to all the meetings and talk to all the partners they would like to, but it's a function I think that will uh, increase. Sales are made quite big in the US. I think uh, that's really an opportunity. We have a strong name and we need some capacity there to just you know, talk to partners, loop in quite some more work. And obviously that can also start in the different regions. So this is just a, a way uh, of uh, visualizing it. Here we showed uh, actually to the advisory board the videos you guys uh, made to give them an impression of uh, uh, the hubs. Uh, so we had little videos because some of our board members have not, uh, supervisory board have not seen the places we work from. Um, yeah, do this as well. Can do. Um, so I think uh, one of the core ideas for this is uh, I think we're in a quite in a unique position in ACFO that we started to think of decentralizing uh, into these different uh, hubs uh, at a phase that we can still do it and we can still together do it in a way that makes uh, sense. I think we're at a critical point in our organization that uh, it's also quite easy to grow and come back here in two years and see uh, 60 people uh, working for ACFO here in Amsterdam. And is that what we want? I think we made the the choice together, all of us over the last years, to really focus on self-sustainable hubs. So a hub should be able to be self-sustainable. They can get work from, you know, partners in Europe that have work to be done in East and Africa, they can do it, but self-sustainable means, you know, focusing on your own work, focusing on the own income and everything around it, but also having the freedom to, uh, within boundaries, that we joint you need to agree upon to uh, to move and be different right I mean the work in the US is different than the work in Asia and in Southeast Asia and that should be the case um, this slide gives an overview of where we formally are in this process so in the USA we're registered as a, a non-profit so we have ACFO Foundation in the US that was mainly done by that time to be able to attract uh, funding and that would be tax deductible uh, and uh, we're now uh, the current uh, board is uh, Mark, Paul, Becky, Katie, Henry. Uh, we plotted here because that's uh, what we're thinking. Uh, because in the US you can actually be in the board and also have operational um, responsibilities, which in the Netherlands is uh, not possible because you're mixing uh, uh, supervisory and execution. But anyway, this uh, currently uh, is what we're looking at and that would mean that Katie and Henry get uh, responsibility uh, there but we also have a, a good obviously uh, connection and uh, that's an area we're starting to uh, to look at um, in Kenya we're registered as a for-profit limited because that was the fastest thing we could get in place it took a month um, and that allows Luke to work there but also to have uh, local employees like Francis and uh, uh, there so this is actually needed, but we're setting up the process of registering a non-profit in Kenya as well, and that will take more than a year paperwork. So the, the limited is more, uh, um, how do you say it, needed to have it. Uh, and in India, we're looking as well for registering. A, well, there's a lot of entities there in India. It's quite tricky, but the idea is in India, it's uh, that's also needed to have an entity, else we cannot accept work from the Indian government, for example. So this is a process we really need to uh, play, uh, pay good attention to um, and, uh, and get in place. And that means that we have these different entities, but we also need to see how do they relate to Act for Netherlands, the contracts and all that uh, type of uh, work. So um, this is an important process, uh, but we uh, really need to focus on the, uh, the next uh, half year or so. To, uh, to get in place and do it correctly because it's also quite easy to do it uh, in the wrong way and uh, so we, we you know you want to have freedom 
but you also have a joint responsibility, particularly at this moment in, uh, in, in our crucial growth, that we do it in uh, the correct way. Growth. Um, this is what we're plotting. Um, this is actually what we've got signed plus what we expect. So the, the things that we already know that will happen uh, would give sort of a forecast model like this. So this is not your forecast, but this is plotting which are the programs and projects we've already secured, and some of them we have this year, so we expect them to continue next year. That's what you're looking at. And um, nothing pipeline, this is where uh, we think it uh, can go and it needs to go to be able to sort of uh, financially support um, the, both what uh, Thomas presented but also these, uh, the growth in the hubs. So that means uh, continued uh, growth moving to uh, six or seven million uh, budget a year. Uh, and it's probably not going to be visualized like this because probably every hub gonna have, has its own sub budget but I mean overall this is what the picture would probably look like. Um, do you want to go here, Thomas? Yeah, sure. Or, because I don't really know which slides are, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're That's going good. to look at. So, so, a couple of years ago, we were here, you know, we've, for three years we've been working, we have 200 partners in our, primarily in our SR there, uh, and there was five million worth of projects in the system. Our SR system and our budget was about 750,000 euros per year. We're here for this year, so we go up to the, the 700 um, partners. Actually, there, there's more than a thousand now. Um, this was a snapshot a little bit earlier. Uh, and once we've loaded the, the partners from coordinating, we're going to be over 1,200 or something. Value of uh, Projects not quite at the moment is uh, just about over 300. Uh, the quarterly ones are another 120 million or something like that. And our budget for this year is 3 million. So, so you can see, you know, we uh, yeah, more, you know, four times the budget or so, and the kind of value jumps up if you measure it this way. Uh, 2015. Uh, I'm expecting it to be something like this, a couple of thousand partners in the system. It, it might not stop there, you know, at least. In, it's very hard to measure things like how, how do you say, what, what's the value of the flow stuff in our system, you know, compared to saying project budgets for RSR. But, you know, we're going to get towards this trajectory. So we've gone ten times the, uh, the budget in this period, but going from visualizing five million to visualizing billions right? and that that's that's when you start hitting that internet scale thing right it's easy to scale internet things in certain areas but there are also other areas where we're not just like a normal internet startup that grows incredibly fast it's this area here because you see 200 partners going to 2,000 partners when the budget will go 10 times so there's some kind of linkage there as well so so because we do a lot of training and consulting and account management on the ground, uh, we're not an internet consumer product that scales differently than a corporate sales sort of business to business type product. Uh, so, but it's it's just interesting to look think of, look at these things and think of what does this mean for us, right? Uh, so then we have uh, uh, the teams, the way. Um, we sort of think they will look like a couple of years from now. And we, we've, we've structured it in, I've actually we've bundled together software and IT operations and building things uh, into one big blob, and we'll look at that one separately. But um, uh, partner operations, Amsterdam, six partnership, working with account management plus technical account management, three. Uh, we've got, uh, well, sorry, partner operations, I meant to say that, and I meant to say account management here, so different things, so, so this stuff is more technical support, and this is more technical account management, this is partner account management, and this is more the operational stuff. Uh, and then we're looking at the different hubs, 
we think we're going to have particularly South Asia, East Asia, Africa, West Africa, South America, North America hubs, uh, possibly UK, Scandinavia, the brackets means there are people working in these other bubbles that are actually co-located in that. This is essentially saying there will be probably a, a sales type person in these locations. Uh, just to give a feel, comms and PR, uh, you know, it doesn't say London here, but there is some kind of London hub at the moment. But the, the idea is there are people spread out in this role in different locations. So, so the core thing with this possibly is that we're you know, 38 at the moment that we have contra long-term contracts with, or people that we're working with that we're expecting are going to stay with us. We have two new out um, offers out at the moment, so 40, and this total is sort of more in the range of 80 to 90 right? in a one and a half year period or something like that, which says, if you do the maths really quickly, it says you're going to add two people to the team every month. Actually, more aggressive than that. It's every month if it's two years. Right? Um, and I want to the, just break apart the, this part. I'm a tech guy, so of course I think tech. Of course, the same goes for every for the other. We need a team doesn't have to say developer to meet the challenge. And this is about that. But here is the 36 part, how that breaks the part into pieces for the tech team, because we have a dead meeting, right? So we've got partners that we work with on the outside that work very closely with us. Seem you're here. Uh, we got Criablo has taken over the Aquapedia for us. We're working with Kaminsky on the consortium sites. Uh, and the, the green stuff is like fully staffed at the moment uh, in relation to the bigger picture that we're aiming at, so RSR and Flow. Uh, and here is you know, who is leading that and what kind of roles they have within that. But then I can see you know, design, we need more to help Luik do the design work with, for all of our products. Uh, we have a management team, we have uh, DevOps and QA, Oliver is uh, leading that, that needs to grow. Uh, we need back-end services, that, actually that stuff, you remember the architectural diagram of the stuff at the bottom? That needs to become something, to, we need somebody to you know, build and run that, we need a new product called, we call Dash at the moment. We need uh, dev comms and tech, de developer communications and technical documentation, internal IT is probably going to need to grow. And then overlapping with an account, uh, uh, with a partner team, technical support, actual round the clock technical support, uh, probably based in the regions rather than based here. Uh, technical account management, a mix of based in the regions and based here. Uh, so, which is, we're 15 ish in these bubbles now, right? Uh, we're going to be 21, and then there's six more in the, that we sort of things we've shared with the partner team, uh, overall 36 here plus uh, technical account and technical support. So one of the things that are important for the, for the developers in this context is you're doing some work right now. Here is where I think we're going to end up. Where do you want to be a couple of years from now? Start thinking about that in this picture. What do you want to do? There is lots of opportunity here to grow into doing things, right? So, so that's why I'm trying to think about this ahead. So you can kind of say, I want to work with these things, I want to work with these things, and gradually we'll mold towards that. Uh, and we're obviously going to end up with something different than this, because we always do, but it's going to be reasonably similar. Um, and then we presented a bit of what's happened with the PR and comp stuff. So um, after uh, the last year, um, here's the you know, part of the team, not all of the team, in our new way of... Oh, she's in the webcam. Oh, she's in the, the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the webcam? Oh, she's here. On top of the tiger, yeah. On top of the tiger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, yeah, in the... Um, or Joe and then uh, Emily in New York. Uh, of course, using our 
new way of presenting things. Uh, we introduced uh, a new look to how we look and what we're doing, and this all is flowing into uh, our new website eventually as well. Uh, and we're going to uh, change the way we discuss and talk about ourselves to it's more emphasis on our products and how our partners use them than anything else. So not so much talking about ourselves and the things that we use, that we do, but more about our partners. Uh, emphasize the programs that we're supporting. So here are a couple, this is from the uh, annual report, right? Where we actually described, you know, we have all these things with like Cordage, you know, NDP, you know, IRC, blah, 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 and actually telling the story about these, right? Uh, and, and one thing, when, we, when you saw the, the bubbles with lift different activities, what's going on where and where it's, it's going to grow, it kind of has a comms bubble in Europe and nowhere else. But you all know that the comms bubble, the guys, and Mark and, and the others, they're making all of us communicate. When you think of it as, you know, nearly everybody in Acro uh, uses Twitter or, or the blog to tell the story of what's going on. One way or another, we communicate internally in a public way this way. We use video, we use all sorts of things. And, and, um, uh, uh, and it, it's essentially a requirement for working with us to be, you know, to be part of the communications team. Everybody communicates. And that's very unusual in nearly all organizations. Uh, it's, it's an important part of what we do. So, so the developer team specifically uh, as we go forward, because we're getting new roles, we're getting new things that we're working on, we need to communicate those things too. So, so uh, you know, we're, we're setting up an operations team, so, so Carl and uh, Oliver, you guys will write a blog about it. That's an important part of showing our partners what we do so that they understand uh, why we're a superior partner to work with compared to the you know, others that they might consider. You just have to show your stuff, essentially. Look, we're great. Uh, we're, uh, we're profiling uh, the partners that we work with. Uh, and I, th this is a really nice initiative. I don't actually know how it started. Mark Vestra at EMAS in Bolivia oh, that's sent us started. a load of photos, and we put them on Flickr as a set, and we've, it's just taken off from there. Yeah, and, and so, so essentially every trainee at any of our training sessions, uh, you know, Flow or SOAR or whatever, gets photographed, right? Because they're they're proud of being part of this. But the they, crucial bit is you you caption them properly in Flickr, and then they become really Googleable. So yeah. if they Google their own name, they find a really nice picture of themselves. Yeah. So so there's like a joint marketing exercise of the individual, as as, as well as the work that we do and the work that the organizations that we work with, our partners, what they do. And this is actually a very important thing because uh, these people were, if you searched on their names or whatever before on Google, they didn't show up, right? But now they do, and they're proud of it. And you'll see the same thing with the water cube, that when we did all these videos of people and the water cube at the World Water Week, that was the video that showed up if you searched on their names, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting way of getting people's attention in different ways. Uh, we've been work, working with uh, uh, getting more uh, uh, languages done in different ways. Uh, the, the new, the new uh, uh, manuals, since French and Spanish are done that way, but there's also the user interface of the products are getting uh, languified, and you know, th there's a whole bunch of that. Um, you know, if you know somebody um, who speaks French and wants to live in West Africa, send them to us. We need more partners type people working in West Africa with us. The languages are really important. And then uh, uh, we continue to involve our design and marketing. Um, uh, and uh, uh, actually, Mark, I'm going to talk, I need to talk to you about this because I want to use this in a graffiti kind of model in Stockholm. Cool. Uh, I found a graffiti artist to, to do, to use that. And um, we're pushing how teams are using our tools as opposed to pushing our tools as much. Right? So, so the story is really about you, know, you and Habitat using our tools to do great stuff and, and to showcase themselves. And, and we're, 
sort of incorporate that into the new web design so that the whole new web design will have a new, whole new marketing message. Um, and and uh, uh, I'm thinking that we're going to have a new website, the, the website at the end of the summer. The, it's not just waiting for the website itself. There are decouplings of other bits of our website and services and RSR and bits that needs to happen. So for example, if you go to aquopedia.org now, or if you go to the normal website and where it says slash wiki and click on the Aquapedia and the toolbar or whatever, you get redirected to aquapedia.org. Uh, so that's part of that decoupling that's happening. That sits on this completely separate server now in a nuclear-proof bunker in Stockholm, <laughs> uh, run by a company called Bahnhof. Uh, and and um, uh, so the, the RSR is going to decouple from the website itself. We're actually going to run uh, our own website on the same services where we run uh, the consortium sites. Uh, so there, there, there's that happening, and, uh, and once that's in place, then we can get the new design in place as well. And we're working hard on the new content for that. Um, that was the end of the strategy presentation. Um, yeah, I've got maybe some. Uh Maybe yeah, to, and then, um, uh, then yeah. we'll, of course, have a question and answer session as yeah. well. No, I think uh, uh, what was quite interesting is because we did this presentation, just to give you a sense of where sort of the advisory board discussions uh, got in. And, and one of these things is uh, uh, when they looked at the sort of the hubs and the global uh, expansion, they said, well, we could have looked at the multinational presentation and a relatively small organization, how are we going to do that and handle that. Um, and one of the core things we spoke is how do you fund growth? Because you can have a lot of partners that want your products, but uh, you can still to be able to, you know, we don't have a lot of reserves or backup. So it's quite a balance. Uh, it's like uh, driving a car and you have a throttle in and a brake at the same time. <laughs> to, you know, how do you, when do we invest in extra people in the region? Because if you do, we might be able to get in more work. But that's a balancing act. So one of the areas where we talk to the board is how do we fund growth? And it could be some major partnership with the Dutch government and others where they also offered help. So out, for example, and I was to see, can we really get some larger multi-year programs in place that would uh, support this? Obviously, if we don't have the resources, we cannot uh, uh, grow as fast as uh, this picture. This is what we think will happen and we want to do, but we need to be able to get that in. So one of the core issues was how do you fund uh, growth? Uh, I think a second thing we spoke about is that when we set up ACFO and Von Koeman's other board member has really pushed us on getting the administration, finance, Catalina as well, uh, to get uh, that in place. And I think if you look at how we're uh, administrating everything and reporting, etc., it's very, very professional since we started. And that has allowed us to grow this fast. So in the different regions, that is also something. We have quite an experienced supervisory board that can help set it up in, uh, correctly in these regions. Because if you're going to grow, you can quickly sort of get caught in internal processes that are not made to scale. So that's an, another challenge is really look at these different hubs now and making sure that all the lessons we've learned here are also transferred correctly. And they might be adapted or changed for different regions, but that we get that right. The, the financial things in place, the partnerships, everything, but also the how you do that so that uh, it can grow. And that's an area where also our uh, supervisory board can play uh, quite a lot of, uh, yeah, an important role, I think. So with them, we've also been talking about, and that goes for everybody here, how do we get very experienced people at sort of supervisory board level in these regions that can help to uh, support these uh, hubs. Um, I think those were yeah, the main the main areas we discussed or uh, talked about. I think it's important to recognize that our board is a supervisory board, so they don't decide. Uh, we can, as an organization, together decide where we want to go, but they do uh, have a lot of experience in, uh, in different regions, and we actually obviously talked uh, uh, also one-on-one -on -one with them and where and how they can um, best support us. And then we had a talk with Scott Harder. I don't know, many of you probably have known, but there's an extra uh, it's a U.S. Uh, person that worked with what the people it was connected to what the people, and has decided to fund uh, the further development of Flow with a pure 
a three thousand dollar grant for a furry development of flow. Three hundred. What did I say? <laughs> Two extra zeros. <laughs> no, so that that's a good thing, and that's uh, that's quite unique. Um, and uh, I think that's also now uh, actually came to our bank account. Yeah, Friday. Right, Friday. So these are, are very positive signs, and uh, so that was also where we spent some time to get uh, to talk to him. I think that was the core of the day.